Now it is my great pleasure and honor to present to you our keynote speaker, Chair of the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education, activist, educator, community, and recent honorary degree recipient at MCLA, Dr. Charles Desmond. So I want to say to start off, um, I have written remarks because everyone who knows me knows that I have a tendency to uh, go on and on uh, talking about things that I'm passionate about. Also, I want to say to the graduates that are here today that are going to be taking your awards shortly, I know that you are all reserved and reflective intellectuals. I know that the outward display of emotion is not something that you always do. But however, I want you to know that before the ceremony is all over, I want to hear some real MCLA noise from you guys. Be loud, be proud, and be positive, okay? <laughs> So, thank you all and good morning. Uh, President Grant, uh, fellow honorees, this, what an amazing distinguished group of honorees. Members of the Board of Trustees here who are absolutely fantastic, distinguished guests, elected officials, graduates, and families. It's an honor to receive this honorary degree and to be here to celebrate this special milestone with all of you in the beautiful North Berkshires, one of my favorite corners of the Commonwealth. My GPS brought me here. I'm sure that I will get back with it as well. Graduates today, everyone in this room, university leaders, distinguished faculty, elected officials, loved ones, families, and friends have assembled to honor your academic achievements as graduates of this magnificent institution. So let me begin by extending my congratulations to each of you, the graduating class of 2014. That's more like it. Thank you. I, I feel better already. Okay, as chairman of the Board of Higher Education, I realize I'm probably the last hurdle you'll have to surmount before you receive your degrees. Provost Cindy Brown told me that um, I should uh, recognize that after I leave the podium, she will be on, uh, issuing your degrees, your, cred your credentials. So uh, uh, I know that you've worked hard and long for this moment, and I want you to be happy when you leave here today, so I've decided to keep my remarks brief. Okay. <laughs> so as chairman, I'm privileged to attend, this, to, to attend commencement ceremonies at campuses all over the state. But coming here today is a bit different. Your campus is unique. This is one of the few public liberal arts colleges in the United States. You've received a precious gift, those of you graduating here today, the gift of a liberal education from a public institution whose mission is to educate practical problem solvers and engaged, resilient, global citizens. Let me tell you, if I can, from my own experience, why I believe the gift of an MCLA education that has taught you how to think critically and to act wisely with sound judgment is so important. As I stand before you this afternoon as your commencement speaker, you might assume that my life unfolded along a clear and uncomplicated pathway culminating with my being here with you today. In actuality, as is in most things in life, uh, things are seldom as they appear or what they might assume. Just quickly, let me share a few touch points about my journey. I'm the youngest of 10 children. I had an alcoholic father and my mother and father divorced when I was one. My mother left my dad left us with him, and he did his best to raise us. But honestly, I realize today we were lucky we made it. I know what it's like to have no heat in your house in winter. I know what it's like to go to bed hungry at night and wake up in the morning wondering what you're going to do and how you're going to make it through the day. Growing up like this, I knew I didn't want to follow in my father's footsteps, but I didn't have people around me to guide me in a direction that would be productive. When I was 18, my older brother gave me a shred of advice. He told me to take the SATs, I did, and after I proved I could do college level work, I somehow got, somehow got myself into Boston University. I started out as an English major, but I wasn't focused at all. To be honest, I spent most of my time off campus in pool halls. I was what you might call a pool shark. I made great money playing pool, essentially teaching rich kids how to part with their cash. <laughs> Back in 
back in 19, back in 1965, when a burger and fr fries cost 50 cents, believe it or not, I could make four or five hundred dollars on a nine ball game. And that's what I did. I spent more time in pool halls than in lecture halls, and I paid a high price for that choice. You can probably guess where this is heading. Uh, one day, a dean at BU called me into the office and he said, Charlie, you seem like a bright young man, but I think you might want to take some time off to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life. In other words, he was inviting me to, to, to leave school because I wasn't putting any energy or effort into it. He was right, so that's what I did. I dropped out of school. But it was the 60s, so that meant shortly thereafter I got another invitation of sorts. The U.S. government tracked me down and invited me to go to Vietnam. <laughs> Let's just say, back in the days of the military draft, that was an invitation I couldn't refuse. <laughs> so, in April of 1968, I found myself an infantry squad leader in the United States Army. I'm on the battlefield in one of the fiercest military encounters chronicled in the Vietnam War. I was surrounded by death and, death and destruction, overrun by the enemy, left for dead on the battlefield, and wondering to myself, how did I get here? In the fog and confusion of the, war, the battle, I had a clear and powerful epiphany, which was that I was there watching people lose their lives in a war that made little sense to me, that had no sight and end, all because I had allowed other people to make choices for me. With relatively little effort, I'd gotten myself into Boston University, but then, with similarly little, little effort, I had gotten myself kicked out, sent into combat, and teetering on the edge of life and death in Vietnam. I was not a very religious person at that time, but I promised God that if I survived, I would try to do something constructive with the rest of my life. I was one of the lucky ones. I made it home to Massachusetts with my mind, body, and spirit intact, and the waste of that war left its imprint on me in a way that changed me, <clears throat> excuse me, in a way that cha changed me that I, in ways that I will never forget. There's something about being close to death that makes you think differently about life. In Vietnam, we used to say, you've never lived until you've nearly died. Anyway, I decided not to waste any more time. I got focused, and for the first time in my life, I began to think about taking responsibility and control of my own future. I applied to Northeastern, I got in, I graduated with honors in sociology, and after graduating, I moved my career along. As you've heard, I got a Fulbright to, to go to Germany, I earned a doctorate in education, as you've heard, and I spent 31 years at UMass Boston. I have a caring and loving wife, Phyllis, who's sitting right here. Thank God for her. Yes. And we have three absolutely wonderful children who are a source of great pride to both of us. Here are two things I learned from all of this that I want you graduates to take with you when you leave this beautiful campus and look for your own unique place in the world. Number one, I want you to know that you are special, much more in, and much more important than you realize. And I hope if you don't come from a background of privilege, that you realize that a background of modest means can actually be an asset and not a liability. You won't find that sentiment in TMZ or on Inside Hollywood, but I believe it to be true. We live in a time of increasing income inequality where the gap between rich and poor is growing wider every day. In fact, the gulf between what the wealthiest 1% of Americans earn and what the other 99% earn is larger than it's ever been in recent American history. But life among the 1% can be pretty insulated. The trappings of wealth and privilege can be compelling, no doubt. But these things don't necessarily keep you in touch with the real world, and they don't guarantee that you'll have the skills you need to survive life's ups and downs. When I was your age, I mistakenly put money first. I didn't realize that I was greater than that, and that I had potential to do more, to do things that I might never have imagined. As a result, I almost threw my life away. I now can tell you that the building blocks of happy, purposeful, and meaningful life are not found in fast hustles or expensive toys, but rather in rich, vibrant, and caring places filled with the types of friends, colleagues, and relationships that you build in institutions just like this one. Money will come and go. Yes. Money will come and go. These relationships are priceless, and they will stay with you 
for the remainder of your life. Which leads me to the second point. I want you to have confidence in the liberal edu arts education you chose for yourself. You're going, you're going out into a world that looks, excuse me, you're going out into a world to look for jobs at a time of great economic anxiety and uncertainty in the United States. You're going to hear people ask the question, is college worth it? After all, after all, college costs so much. I don't need to tell you that, of course, and I certainly don't need to tell your parents that. And you're also going to hear a great deal about the need for certain skills needed to land employment. What is, while it's true that petroleum engineers and IT professionals are in high demand today, it's also true that you are likely to change careers half a dozen times over the course of your life. You may not need, you may not need to simply find a job, you may need to invent a job. And because of that fact, you're going to need the skill set that comes from a liberal arts education, where you receive much more than the knowledge needed for certain professions. You may or may not realize it now, but what your liberal arts education has given you is exactly the set of skills that employers say is lacking in many of the job applicants they see. This is supposed to take 11 minutes and 18 seconds. So, <laughs> so I think I've got about two and a half minutes left. So bear with me, folks. <clears throat> they want job applicants who know how to think critically, not just regurgitate information. So if you're taking courses that are majored in philosophy or women's studies or anthropology, you've learned to think critically. And you can use that essential skill across all sorts of employment categories. Employers want to hire folks who are problem solvers. Chances are your studies at MCLA have included experiences requiring you to do exactly that. Apply your theoretical understanding of the issues to real life situations. This is why service learning and civic engagement are not just nice things to do. You're, just, you're not just helping others, you're learning how to solve problems. And the third thing that all employees want, which I believe all of the graduates here have, is the ability to write with clarity and to speak with conviction. Your liberal arts education has given you the tools and capacity to excel in whatever situation or circumstance that comes before you. No matter whether your next job is at Google, Apple, or Intel, at a research lab or at a retail store, you have the knowledge and skills to stand out and you'll be recognized and rewarded for your earned success. So, if some of you graduate from MCLA knowing how to code or how to teach physics, that's great. You have acquired specific content knowledge that is in high demand right now. But all of you have acquired the core attributes of a liberal education that will make you competitive and productive, not only in the job market, but more importantly, in life. You're entering the adult world at a time when two unpopular wars have just ended. People are looking at the price we've paid for these interventions, looked at their lives and asked, what happened to my American dream? I'm not telling you that life is going to be easy out there. There's a lot of social, political, and economic anxiety in the world today. But I want you to have faith in what you know and confidence in what you can do. The enduring value of the degree you receive today is not simply in the knowledge that you've gained. Nor, it is in the, nor is it in the thoughtful papers that you've authored, nor, it is, nor is it even in the degree that you will shortly receive. The lasting impact of all that you've studied and all that you've learned here at MCA, MCLA will be found in the qualities of mind, strength of heart, measures of compassion, and elements of character that guide you, strengthen you, and fortify you to withstand whatever trials and challenges you face throughout your life. So, as you go forward from here today, don't let anyone tell you that you aren't exceptional. Believe me, you are some of the most exceptional people on earth. Stan Storm, class of 2014, America needs you. Have confidence, class of 2014, the world awaits you. Godspeed and abundant blessings to all of you. Thank you very much.